Good evening. Thank you all for joining us for this live conversation with poet Ruth Padel, who comes to us from London, and pianist Carl Lutchmeyer, who comes to us from Oxford. Many of you have watched our four-part series, Beethoven Variations. Um, you can type your questions in the Q&A box. Let me begin by asking you, Ruth. You visited all these places that were part of Beethoven's life, castles and homes and archives in Poland and the Czech Republic, Bonn and Vienna, of course. So there was a literal journey for you as you wrote the book. Tell us about some of your travels and discoveries. Well, it was my first, my first journeys were really done in, to Bonn in, um, in Germany. And it was October, it was the end of October. So I went, I stayed in the street where he was born. I mean, that was just amazing. It, it's now, of course, a little tourist precinct, but it was just extraordinary to be sleeping in the street where he was born, um, visiting his house. And then I went out, I walked around, I visited the site of various other houses um, and went down the, the river, the um, Rhine, to the mountain he climbed, which magnetized him, um, the Drakensfels. And that was extraordinary. It's beautifully done. It's a wonderful museum if you ever have a chance to visit it. Then I went to Vienna. I went to Vienna several times. It's such a complex city. And I had lived there for about six weeks when I was a student trying to learn German. It didn't really take. Um, but my father was a psychoanalyst, and I also met my parents there when they went to a psychoanalytic um, conference. I even shook hands with Anna Freud. And I began to see Vienna as this city which has got a complex past where psychoanalysis had to be invented because there's so much past, there's so much unconscious. And of course, for my Jewish friends, it's the city of treachery. And um, that comes into the book too. When I went to one of the museums, which is actually the flat where he lived longest because he kept moving houses in Vienna. Yes, that's right. And There's several Beethoven houses all over Vienna. That's right. He kept, he must have lived in about 70 different places. Yes. And, you know, behind the door is a sign saying that this was made into a museum in 1941. And the family living there, who were Jewish, were sent to Auschwitz. So I thought, my God, this is a really complicated, dark city, beautiful and dark. Then I was very lucky to in, be invited to um, the University of Silesia, which is in Poland. And I discovered it's very near uh, a very important castle where his great patron, Prince Lichnowsky lived. And I said, yes, I, I would love to come to them and, and, and give a reading and talk to them but could they please take me to this? And they did, they took me over the border to the Czech Republic and I saw these Silesian palaces. And then finally, I went and read poetry in Krakow in Poland. And again, I said, yes, I'd love to come, but I've discovered that there are some Beethoven manuscripts there. And please, could I have an interpreter and, and be taken to this archive where I can see them? So I felt I was in the heart of Europe and Europe is such a complicated place. And there are so many hearts of it, really. And Vienna, I realized, is the, is the beginning of Eastern Europe. But it was the center of Europe, the center of cultural Europe for a very long time. It was the heart of the Holy Roman Empire. So on this brink of Britain leaving the European Union, which, of course, I don't think is a good thing, um, I was looking at this Europe, which was falling into fracture just at the time Beethoven was writing. So it was a very complicated, exciting, empathetic journey for me over all these places. Thank you. Uh, it sounds wonderful. Um, Carl, I'm going to ask you about the title of the book, Beethoven Variations. Uh, you began with that exquisite piece of juvenilia written by the 12-year-old Beethoven, the Dresler Variations, and then went on to the Eroica Variations, uh, you also mentioned the great forebear, of course, Bach's Goldberg variations. Um, and you described motifs as the bricks, the DNA of the house or cathedral in the case of Beethoven. Could you tell us about some of the, the forms at which Beethoven was such a great master? Well, 
thank you, Pratiti, and, and, and how lovely to see you again, Ruth. So nice to see you. Um, so, yeah, it's very interesting that that Beethoven is one of many, many composers writing variations at this time, but most variation forms at this period are popular variation forms. They're variation forms on popular tunes, probably opera tunes or, or common um, uh, folk tunes and so on. And they're largely, as far as we can tell, pieces for people to buy and play at home. Um, it's for the home market for consumption. And, and all of the composers, far, men, far more lesser composers, and then equally Haydn, Mozart, Beethoven, would write these. And there are, there are many Beethoven variations, which are frankly pot boilers on, on this or that theme that is now almost entirely forgotten. But it does seem to me that this idea of take exactly the same Beethoven brings the material back and he's varied it and that catches our ear and it takes us on a journey that perhaps other composers didn't do and that, you know, that longevity is extraordinary. So certainly the variation form is found not just in variations, but in lots of different places. So for instance, of course, Beethoven takes the, the sonata to its highest form of that period, beyond Hartmann Haydn, beyond Mozart, but it's not unusual to find a variation movement out in one of the sonatas of, of three or four movements. We have one in the Opus 26 A-flat sonata, we have one in the Opus 109 late sonata, um, we get variation sets. Uh, but in terms of broader forms, certainly the sonata in terms of piano music is, well, they used to say that um, you, you could call the 32 Beethoven sonatas the New Testament of the piano, uh, the Old Testament being Bach's Preludes and Fugues, and between them you had the full cornucopia of, of piano music. That's not, I think, entirely true, but I think it's, it's very fair that those 32 sonatas do produce a corpus of work that is like a, a testament, like, a, like a, an outlook in that sense, um, a fully rounded outlook. Um, and so the sonata is certainly something that he takes on board from Haydn, from Mozart, develops in the first section of his life, in his first style period, to an extraordinary level that, that's larger and more elemental than any of, I would say, any of the piano sonatas that would go before. He then, in the middle period, turns it into something different. We have the famous Waldstein and the Passion Art sonatas, which have so much power in them and, 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 and breadth of scale, and yet, quite frequently, small ideas, varied, built like a DNA into a huge cathedral. And then the last period of his life where he cuts everything down. Uh, he uses only that which he needs. There's no, there's no posing, there's no gargantuanism. It becomes something that is lean and particularly songful. Um, and that move from something that's very rigorous into something very songful is mirrored in, in all of his works, but we see this very strongly in sonatas. Of course, likewise, although far fewer, we have the symphonies, which do roughly the same thing, and in the same sort of order as the sonatas. They, they start off taking the Viennese idea of the symphony to the next level, something much grander, something more surprising, something perhaps a little subversive. And then we get, for instance, the Eroica Symphony, which is and the Fifth Symphony and the Sixth Symphony, such powerful uh, outlooks and to some extent foreshadowing romanticism. And then right at the end of his life, these, these works that look absolutely forward like, like the Ninth Symphony. Um, and, and in terms of other forms, of course, I'm not sure we could call the Bagatelle a form. It's more, it's more sort of a bag to put your ideas in rather than a form. So it, 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 it takes the form or whatever stuff is in it, which is rather lovely. Um, and in some senses is, is subversive in not having a given or, or standard structure. It, it, it molds itself to its material. And of course, this is going to be very useful to people like Schumann and Mendelssohn and to some extent Chopin, who walk forward with those ideas and say, well, let's just see what the material is and bend the form around that. And I think that's, that's very, very interesting at that time of Beethoven. So I think those are the, the, the key elements. Of course, there are, there are other pieces here and there which are um, rondos or, or little dance pieces. And, and, and he, you know, he's always writing. There's so much extra music, um, what we call the woo music. Um, the, instead of an opus number, it has a W-O-O, -O, which stands for Werke ohne Opus, uh, works without opus number. And these are sometimes considered to be Beethoven's shrapnel, but actually they're extraordinary wealth of interesting music in there. That's where the Dressler variations are. That's where uh, Furalese is. So many of these really interesting, fascinating works almost straight from the heart of Beethoven's pen appear in outside the opus numbers, outside the works that he say, this is a work, this is a piece. Gosh, isn't that interesting? You know, 
Well, you always said, Carl, that um, Haydn was 50 years ahead of his time with everything. And if you had Haydn as your comp composition teacher, which Beethoven did, um, I guess, you know, you, you would be set. But, but uh, you know, how much of an influence did Haydn really have on Beethoven? How, how deep was that relationship? Musically, it's very, very difficult to say. Uh, certainly, there was great respect on both sides. And, and Beethoven dedicates things to Haydn, and Haydn is very aware of Beethoven as, as this. I mean, remember, Beethoven, Haydn only dies in 18, um, 1809. So he's fully in Vienna to see the, his students rise. But by all accounts, um, their lessons were difficult. And I'm not really, you know, Beethoven was, was problematic and, and recalcitrant and, and a, bit of a, a bit of a rebel and so on. And Haydn was, although so creative and having created the sonata and the symphony and the string quartet and all of these forms, um, was fairly, fairly fastidious, I think, as a teacher. And I'm not sure they actually suited each other as teacher pupil particularly well. I think they absolutely suited each other as colleague, colleague, and, and there was clearly a very strong relationship there. But I mean, if you were going to pin me down and say, how much did Beethoven learn from Haydn? I think probably very little, or if he, well, the things he learned were probably in the negative of how he wasn't going to do something rather than how he was going to do something, how he's going to take something much further or evolve it. So yeah, curious, curious relationships. The person he really measured himself against was Mozart, even when he was a teenager. I mean, we've got one sketchbook in which he um, writes out a piece and then says, no, no, this is like Mozart. And he redoes it and said, this is, the, he says it in Latin, Beethoven ipse, Beethoven himself. So even from the age of 13, 14, he is measuring himself against the person he regards as most innovative and mm -hmm. trying to go beyond him. And that person is Mozart. Mm, absolutely. Mm. Though he was, he, was, uh, he was not so happy with Mozart's keyboard skills, his actual playing. He said he heard him a few times and he felt that he played in a very old fashioned style. And Brayton was very clear that he wanted to play in the new style on the new grander piano. And he was going to play legato so the notes were joined rather than detached. And he found that, that piano style of Mozart's sort of of the 18th century and clear we see clearly that Beethoven wants to be the pianist of the 19th century which is a very different beast I suppose but yeah. It's funny because Mozart was brought up playing the harpsichord so you play you play and the note stops you can't yeah. have a long singing time in, in the and that must have affected playing I suppose do you think? Uh, ab ab absolutely um, you know Mozart and all of that generation's ears were adjusted to the harpsichord and the clavichord which is a very small sound and they weren't used to this this much broader broader sound, and and indeed even their their contemporaries. Um, there's this wonderful crit uh, in the newspapers when um, I, it's just before 1800, I think, and it's of Beethoven. Well, it's of a person playing, but it's clearly Beethoven. And the complaint is that he joins the notes up, and they find this horrific. And it, they say, you know, he, he basically says the guy doesn't know how to play the piano because. He doesn't know how to take his note off one, his finger off one note before playing the next. And of course, we never do that anymore. We think this is madness, but there's, you know, clearly strong partisanal camps at this point which, who say, yes, this is bad playing, this is good playing. And you're either in one, the sort of forward looking camp, or you're in the very elegant 18th century camp, which says, no, each note is a separate um, pearl on a string and they must all be quite, quite beautiful and separate. But even Beethoven's pedal would not have quite been like today's pedal, isn't it? Absolutely. Beethoven was, yes. Beethoven was really, the, he drove the development of the piano at this point. And, and two of his closest friends were a couple who ran a piano factory in Vienna and he got to know them very early on. He was very good at making friends early on who, were, who became very important musically in different areas. And um, he used to go to their, to their workshop and say, I want a piano like this. So they would keep having to make it stronger and stronger. In fact, there's a, you know, the, even the sort of the engineering of how you make wire, he, he drove that too, because the piano wire had to be strong enough to, to withstand what he did to it. Yeah. And, and there are all these wonderful stories about how the piano would basically, in concert, crumble under his touch and, and someone would be pulling out the broken hammers as they went along because everything was just collapsing because it couldn't, couldn't stand the onslaught of Beethoven. Um, Ruth, did you want to add something to the variations, how you came to pick this title? Yes, I was thinking 
I suppose a lot of my own work is about how you create, how you, what is creativity and what drives it. Um, and I was thinking about him so much and I was very, very interested in that, although he played the violin and viola from a very early age and was playing the viola in, in the court orchestra in Bonn from the age of 10 onwards, um, with his little sword and his wig for concerts and all the rest of it. Um, it was really the keyboard that drove him and inspired him. And, and that was how he got known. He got known for playing and he got known for improvising very early on. And that was how he stormed Vienna when he first made his name there as winning all the improvising contests. And variation and indeed development, which is the key to the sonata form, is... is it's very like, it's, it's like innovation, it's like improvisation. You are creating in your hands, in your mind. I don't know what it feels like, Carl, you would tell me, but as you go along. And that was what struck the sparks of him. And it's very interesting when he has his sort of period of writer's block from 1812 to about 1816, and then 1817, he begins with a, a song cycle and then he goes back to the sonata, piano sonata, to the Hammerklavier sonata, as when he was a teenager, it was the piano, even though he couldn't play any longer, the piano that drove him. Do you think that, that feels right to you, Carl, that it's the, it's the idea of creating out of the very keyboard? Uh, absolutely. And, and we see this in, in the sketches, um, the, the notebooks, because he's always writing figurations down. And, and in some sense, this is a bit like jazz pianists. Jazz pianists, they, they learn a riff and then they learn it in all 24 keys and they can do it backwards, forwards and so on. And we see Beethoven doing this all the time in his sketchbooks. And he's got a new figure, a new idea that, that works in this way or that way. And it really comes out of, so strongly comes out of the piano. But I suppose that the Beethoven genius is that it's so beautifully balanced with what comes out of the heart and the mind as well. It's not just the kind of empty figuration that we see in a number of the lesser composers, the Pixies and the Hertzes of this time, who are only figuration. Beethoven has captured that figuration and taken it beyond. But I absolutely agree with you, Ruth. It, 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 it comes out of that elemental relationship with the keyboard instrument, absolutely. You mentioned um, the uh, Bach preludes and fugues. Uh, the, the, the fugal movement, David Waterman had spoken about the fugal movements in the quartets. Um, and again, you know, the, the influence of Bach, which no one can avoid. Um, could you say a bit about the, the form of the fugue, what it is and how sure, they yeah. it? I mean, what I, what I will say before I tell you about fugues is that one of the one of the other things that Beethoven was perhaps not famous for, but much in demand for in Vienna when he arrived, was for playing Bach's Preludes and Fugues. And the very famous Baron von Swieten, who, who has been friend of Mozart and helped with magic flute and all sorts of things like that, and knew Haydn very well, used to invite Beethoven around to his house, and he would say, "Oh, do do," he says, "Bring your nightcap, essentially, bring your pajamas," and would you mind coming over one evening and just playing some preludes and fugues? Because no one was playing them. You couldn't hear preludes and fugues of Bach at that time in Vienna. They'd sort of been forgotten. And Beethoven was one of the very few people who, who would play the complete uh, preludes and fugues. And, and that was fascinating to a particular set or branch of, of the aristocracy in Vienna. Um, the fugue is, is essentially a way, an amazing way of generating an arc of music from very small material. And what happens is you have what we call a, a subject, which is the, the opening theme. And it's often just two, three bars long. And then that theme is repeated in what we call voices. So usually um, in a piano fugue, you'll have four or five different voices, sometimes only three. Of course, if it's a fugue for voices, literal voices, singers, as we might find in, in, a, um, a Mo in Mozart or something, uh, we might have nine or 10 voices. But for a piano fugue, you usually have three or four. And each one enters with this theme and then plays other music while the next voice enters with a theme. And essentially, most of the music in this usually four or five minute piece, but certainly can be much longer in the case of Beethoven's Hammerklavier Sonata, the last movement is, is an enormous fugue, um, is derived, most of the music is derived from that opening material. And again, one could certainly talk about the idea of a DNA, which is, is threaded through the music. And sometimes we get the theme backwards or upside down or in different combinations with itself. Um, and it's just a fascinating way 
of writing music that actually is very cumulative. So you, because you're starting from just a kernel of sound, but by the end, you've got so much happening in quite a complex way, it, it creates apotheosis. It can be quite overwhelming. And it's interesting that essentially Fugue had pretty much died as an art form in about 17, by about 1750, 1760. People weren't writing fugues very much after that. In fact, um, shockingly, when Bach died, the, the governors or, or, or the, the committee, if you like, of the church where he, was, where he was working were quite pleased because it meant they could get some modern or classical music instead of all this old fashioned um, Baroque music and, and particularly the fugue because the, the fugue was a dead form by the time Bach died and he was out of fashion. Um, and um, in fact, they used to call it learned music and that was, that was pejorative. They did, learned music meant just old fashioned and dry. And then suddenly, largely Beethoven, a couple of other people, a bit later on Mendelssohn, get the fugue back. They, they recapture the fugue for this new generation and turn it into a very different thing. But they realize that the power that can be, can be energized from this idea of taking a very small bit of music and, and developing only out of that music, this much larger form in, in multiple voices, gives a variety of nuance, touch, feel, to, to the classical period, that's quite shocking at this time and very, very arresting. And so the fugue becomes a key thing in the early 19th century and is used by, by everybody. Even, even Chopin wrote a fugue. It's not a particularly good one, but he realizes that a fugue is something that he has to capture as well and sits down and writes the Chopin fugue and so on. I think a, a lot of Beethoven's sort of understanding of the fugue came very early because his, his early teacher, his or the organ teacher, Neffer, um, actually brought him up on the art of fugue. And, and the recent biographer, Jan Swafford, says that he may have been the, one of the first people outside the Bach family themselves to grow up on that music. So he had it in his own DNA, as it were, from, his, from the age of 13 or so. Um, and I think this, you know, I, I kept thinking when, when I was, was, was writing this, for instance, in, in Opus 18, number six, the, the last of the first quartets, um, there's, a, there's a wonderful variations and fugue and variations are very close together, of course. And, um, you know, I thought, what is a fugue? Because another meaning of the word fugue is a flight, a mental flight an absence. And I once asked the great critic, George Steiner, who's a friend of mine, what, what, do, you, what do you think a fugue means? And he said, somebody is before you on the path. I thought that's so interesting that it is a sense of a journey. You don't have, you can't have a fugue for only one pe person. There has to be more than one person doing it. And so it is about doing your own journey alongside other people or behind other people, but consonantly with them. It's about relationship. I thought, I mean, I just think that fugue, like variation, is kind of almost at the heart of how Beethoven creates. Mm, yeah. That's, that's one, a wonderful way to think of the fugue. I mean, you always think of uh, flight and, and uh, voices taking flight or the chase, uh, but uh, to see this as this sort of uh, a web that we're all, that, you know, the, 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 the uh, David Waterman referred to them as characters in a novel. Yes. And, uh, <laughs> so, um, the way uh, that uh, these characters evolve and relate to each other. Um, we have some questions here. Someone uh, from the Q&A box, Vivek Bami, who says, it seems that Beethoven read some Indian philosophy and could have been influenced by it in his spiritual journey. Could you please comment on this? Was, was he exposed to 19th century Orientalism or? Uh... He certainly was, yes. He was, he loved Goethe and Goethe from about sort of the 1780s had been very interested in Oriental philosophy and poetry and um, indeed wrote the New Divan. And about that time, a German translator, translation of Shakuntala came out and Beethoven got hold of it and read it. This was in particularly his years. We know because he kept a diary between the age, years of about sort of 1812 and 1816, um, when um, he'd given up his last great love. And of course, in, in um, Kalidasa's play, it's the, it's the woman who loses the, the king who is cursed to forget her and wanders the world. And he identified with her and he, he felt that he was wandering through 
the world and that only virtue would hold you. He writes, he writes out a line from Shakuntala in his, in his journal, only virtue must hold your feet to the path. He also read some other, other stuff. I don't know, um, I don't know what it was, the, the, um, but he was very taken with the idea of educating people on the spiritual path. Um, he imagined pagodas in, in Indian mountains, which I don't think pagodas is quite right, but anyway, that's the word he, word he uses. And he imagines um, a spiritual journey, which is trained to be educated in, towards the good. And, and he never, he, 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 at this time, he is really sort of developing his spiritual side of a sense of God inside him, instead of the much more lively and outgoing self that he was up to 1812. And I think Indian philosophy helped him, also Indian music. He writes out the Indian scale in his, in his diary. Somebody must have told him about Indian music. So oh. um, I don't think it was a very big influence on him, but he was, he was always curious, always responding to spiritual ideas um, that would take him further. That's quite a revelation that Beethoven actually wrote in his diary what could have been maybe in his mind a mode, but would have been a raga of some kind. Yeah, it's the, um, it's the, it's the Indian scale of sort of sa, re, pa, and all the rest of it. Oh. Um, he gets one wrong. Um, I can't remember which one he gets wrong, um, but um, somebody must have told him. I don't know. I don't know where he got it from. I don't know. I mean, does what any was any Indian music heard outside India at that point on, in Europe? I don't know. Um, there had been um, da dancers from India who had gone on a tour and come to Europe, and certainly he would have heard about it. But uh, I, I don't know. If, I don't know. You know, I don't want to misspeak. It's quite early for him mm. to have heard Indian music in Europe. Yes, yes. I think if, I think if he'd actually heard it during those years, he would have put it in his diary because he would have been so excited. Oh. Um, but I, so I think this is more probably from a text. He's looking at a book in some way or other. Right. Um, so where... Go ahead. I was going to say, it's, it's interesting, though, that whilst he will still put um, Janissary, uh, Turkish influences into some of his music, we don't see any influences from, from further afield, or at least I, I can't, I haven't certainly come across them, we don't notice that. So um, what's very interesting, he's got a, a very wide field of interest, but then he's still writing very definitely for um, a music that will be understood by those people around him in that community, so yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, could you tell us about the Turkish influence in his music? Oh, well, of course. Um, I mean, this, this was a trope in, in Vienna. I mean, obviously the, the Turks were um, on, the, on the doorstep, not, not infrequently. And so, um, I mean, of course, first of all, we get Mozart doing also, not least the Turkish Rondo, but also the, um, uh, from the Sarai opera and so on. Um, uh, Beethoven, of, perhaps most famously, uses it in the Ninth Symphony to suggest the other music outside Europe, and to suggest that all men are brothers and that all musics are, are, are one and, and so on. And so um, that works on many, many levels, both musically and, and philosophically. But it's, it's used just in, in, as a trope to say, OK, this is, as I say, we might call Oriental, what we might call other. And it's also part of the music we make. And I, I mean, that's, that's very, very important. And, and don't, yeah, don't forget the Turkish influ influence in Vienna, because you know why a croissant is called a croissant? It was invented by the bakers of Vienna because they were supposed to have saved the city of Vienna from the Turks. When the, when the Turks were besieging the city, um, they'd been beaten back. So they started to, to tunnel underneath. And the bakers who have to be up so early in the morning in order to bake their bread, they were up at three in the morning and they heard this tunneling. So they, they warned the garrison and the Turks were beaten back. And after that, they invented the croissant, which is for the crescent moon in the little shape of a pastry in a crescent moon, which was on the Turkish flag to remind everybody that they had been the ones to beat the Turks back. Mm -hmm. Very interesting, very interesting. I, I did not know that. That's amazing. <laughs> the <laughs> contribution of the bakers. <laughs> um, this, uh, Vivek Bami asks another question. How could Beethoven express emotions that no other composer seemed to be able to do? 
Um, and certainly uh, there is a, a, a way in which uh, Beethoven's music captures emotion very differently from what has gone before it. I think, uh, Ruth, you and David spoke about it in the late quartets uh, in, the, in our last episode. Um, but yeah. could you all comment? Yes, um, the last quartets, of course, are the sum of his mu whole musical journey. But I think one, at one level, one answer I, I might offer would be that he's always put emotion first. He is desperately interested in form. Form is what he thinks with, but he always put emotion first. And if somebody played for him and played a wrong note, he would say, no, don't worry about the notes. It's the feeling that matters. It's the passion. And when he did this great work, the um, Mrs. Solemnis, for his great friend and pat patron, the Archduke Rudolf, it took him five years, much, much longer than he was supposed to do it. But um, he's, he wrote to it on, on the top, from the heart, may it go to the heart. Oh. And I think that at one level is why he speaks to us so emotionally, because emotion was what he cared about. And in his final years, when he's writing these string quartets, um, it is almost, he's thinking innovatively with form, with fugue, as well as all sorts of other things, but he's thinking it in order to get to emotion. I mean, he, the emotions he's having in his personal life as he's writing those are very um, upsetting and almost, rather for us, upsettingly trivial. He's jealous of his stepson, his, his, his son, his adopted son's mother. Um, he's writing appalling letters to her, to him. He's um, worried about being ill and so on. But out of, and, and, and um, in 130, there's a wonderful movement when, which he marks the Klempt sort of, um, um, how, I, how, I don't know how you translate, um, sort of aghast, ag aggrieved. Um, and he and it's the most wonderful music, but it's really because he's so jealous of the of the uh, mother and his nephew he's at such odds with. Um, so out of the most trivial sometimes emotions can come the most profound expression of emotion that is universal to the hilt. I don't know, you might have quite different ideas, Carl. No, not at all. I think I, I would only add that we, we must remember that, that Beethoven was one of the first important post-revolutionary, as in um, French revolutionary, composers. And in that philosophy, where the individual is becoming important and the hierarchy is not important, and one man, by dint of their own strength, power, energy, effort, life, creates something of themselves, immediately changes the outlook of what is music for? What, how, does, how does music work? Whereas we might find in an 18th century uh, minded composer, an elegance of music that is about how, it's, how it relates to other music, how it's structured, how it, it might be used. With Beethoven, we get this first person who says, no, this, the music is about me, is about the individual, it's about you, as I say, may, well, as you say, uh, may it go from the heart the heart. This is incredibly important. This is a new outlook, it seems to me, about music. I suppose the closest we get is someone like Bach, who is doing it for his, for his God, which has, is a slightly different relationship. But the idea that, that one composer saying, no, this is about us who stand on this planet and it's from me to you, I think gives that, um, gives that philosophy the meaning that allows him to, to create music in that way from, from the pictures, from the notes. But I do think that going back to Mozart for a moment, he he has learnt from the most emotional passages of Mozart, something like Dove Sono in um, in the Marriage of Figaro, or maybe this the relation of viola and the violin in, in the Sinfonia Concertante. I mean, when you listen to the cadenzas which he wrote of the Sinfonia Concertante, it is the most agonised sharing. Mm -hmm. of two instruments and I think he learned from those I mean he played in all the Mozart operas although he wasn't very good at structuring the drama of an opera as we know he, he Fidelio took him a very long time and it was very hard um, he he was he sat through and played nearly all the Mozart operas from the ages of 10 to 20 
And, you know, sometimes he would discuss one aria with one of his great friends in, um, for, for weeks. So he's really fastening on the emotionality that there is within the 18th century shell of Mozart, I think. And he just took that so much further. Mm -hmm. No, I, I, that, that's absolutely fair. I mean, Beethoven was clearly learning from everyone and everything he could, he could find and, and taking it up and reprocessing it in, as, as an individual or whatever. That's uh, certainly... That's, we have a question from Priya Chaturvedi. She says, the programmatic titles put to some of Beethoven's works surely restrict people's understanding of them by limiting the imagination. Example, Moonlight, Sonata, Pastoral Symphony, the, the stories that Schindler ascribed to Beethoven's inspiration as in the Opus 90 Sonata. Could you comment? Oh, I could comment all day. It infuriates me. Um, and, and I, I mean, it, uh, these, these titles narrow, they, they cheat, they take you to places that Beethoven probably didn't make, mean us to go. And, and the fact that, you know, Beethoven mostly does not title his pieces, uh, other than sonata or, or variations or symphony or whatever. Um, and, and that's, he could have done. Other people did, and he chooses just to put this piece out as it is, um, and to allow the individual's mind reaction to go where it goes. Um, and, and of course, a title given later is always subject to the, the culture of its time and, and of the individual who gives it. And almost invariably, that is going to be different from our time. So, um, you know, because Reil Stab thinks that the first movement of the Opus 27, number two sonata, reminds him of, of moonlight, moonlight on, on Lake Geneva. Now for all time, everybody has to imagine moonlight on Lake Geneva. And, and, and I'm, you know, clearly, as far as I can see, with my musicologist hat on, that first movement is very clearly a slightly quirky funeral march. Um, and, and it is slightly quirky because it's got that undulating triplets all the way through, but everything else about it has the seven key issues of being a funeral march and, and why you would talk about it as moonlight and, and wafting um, sort of gracefully at night rather than something more agonizing, possibly with some reminiscence in it. I'm not sure. Um, so yes, it, it, as you can probably see, it vexes me beyond, beyond anything that's decent. The, the, the reappraisal by, not even by us, by, by 19th century well-meaning people saying it's this and that and publishing it in that way, which creates something other than the pure music and the pure reaction to that music that, that we involve. But, but what, what about you? What do you think, Ruth? Does, does it bother you? Yeah, I was, I was going to, um, just for the sake of argument, take another view, which is that people want and put names to things. And if you call something the moonlight or the tempest, People will come to it for that, but then maybe they will open their ears and their minds and react to it in their own way. So in the end, does it do much harm? Because if you know the music, you forget about the title anyway. And if you're, you know, if you're a teenager and listening for the first time and you hear, going back to Vivek's question, you, you get um, you get the emotionality, you get the different emotions in the Moonlight Sonata and um, the title falls away and you just get yourself in response to the music. So maybe it doesn't matter in the end. <laughs> <laughs> I, we will have to, we'll have to disagree on that one. I think probably I am slightly jaded because I see I have seen so many students who come to me, and as it happens, the tempest is a particular one because they're trying to play bits that are not tempestuous, tempestuous. They are not actually going to say, "Oh, actually, let's look at the Shakespeare and see how it relates to this," even if it does at all. And we're not even sure if Beethoven was just being ironic when you know um, it was a Schindler or Czerny who was pestering him for what does it mean. And, and he just says, oh, go read The Tempest. He might yeah, just have been in a bad mood that day. Just go away. Um, who knows? I, 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 and so when people are trying, oh, well, this is the bit when Caliban turns up and so on, that just annoys me so much because it's clearly, or it seems to me clearly, layering some narrative that is unlikely to have been, even if Beethoven did have that narrative, the same narrative that, that Beethoven had, and maybe restrict imagination. But I, I do absolutely take your point uh, that if that gets you in and then you're able to drop the title, brilliant, that, that is great. Um, what I do find, as it happens, particularly in the Moonlight Sonata, performances get slower and slower as people try and make them more moonlighty. Um, yeah. 
I, I was thinking of, sorry, I was thinking about, about listeners. Of course, I wasn't thinking like you are about students, about performers. Which if performers get affected by it, then it's bad. Yeah, I agree with that. Yeah, no, sure. um, well, you just spoke about tempo speeding up. Um, in your discussion with David Bottom and Ruth, there was a discussion of tempo and metronome markings in Beethoven. Uh, can we believe the metronome markings? Uh, was the metronome uh, different from the metronome today? Um, I don't know anything about that, but I do know that um, everybody finds Beethoven's markings very fast. <laughs> I don't know if that's true in the in the uh, sonatas car, but um, very definitely. But most famously in the Hammer Clavier Sonata, where the opening tempo is is very very fast. It is doable, but I'm not sure it makes sense. Um, yeah, we certainly we do find problems with the, with the metronome markings. The metronome was largely the same as it is today. Uh, I mean, obviously the clockwork version, not the electric one, but but yeah, essentially the same thing. Um, I think uh, so. Beethoven was very very excited by the metronome because it gave him another way for us to, to transmit the, the character. And he's always, those, he sometimes puts lots of words, particularly at the end of his life in, in the, the later sonatas and, and so on, lots of words to describe exactly how, what the mood, the character should be, the affect, we call it. Um, and he says, you know, the metronome is gonna be really useful because it gives us the idea of the character. Uh, there, there are two, maybe three problems. The first is that Beethoven's character markings, whether they be metronomes or words, well, clearly set up to be the beginning of the piece, and then you took the piece where it went. It was the idea was never that the whole movement would be at one tempo. And and Ch Cherny says of Beethoven, you know, he was very very strict in timing. He always kept strict tempo, except that in virtually every bar he sped up or slowed down. Um, so what does strict tempo mean at that point? That's something quite other. And he certainly used to speed up in crescendos and slow down in diminuendos. Lots of people from the period talk about this. So this idea of anything metronomic is, is slightly strange. And we know he used to play the second uh, subject, the second theme in a sonata, usually slower than the first theme. Lots of people discuss that. So really, you know, one thing is that metronome mark was frequently not for the whole movement, but just to give you an idea. The second issue, and this happens all the time even today, um, a composer generally writes a piece and then sets the metronome marking in his mind and doesn't play the metronome marking. He just goes, oh, it's, it's that. When you play a piece through in your head, it's always faster than you actually play it when you have to play the sound and listen to the sound because it just takes longer. Um, and, and, you know, I've, I've seen this with, with modern composers as well. They set the time because they've done it on the train in their head and that's exactly the right tempo. They come to the rehearsal, they go, why are you playing it so fast? And you set the metronome up. He said, oh, no, no, that just doesn't work or it doesn't work in here. Um, and so I suspect that on many occasions, those tempo markings are a bit too fast for, for that reason. Um, and, you know, thirdly, maybe occasionally, based, I, I'm not sure, not all the time, certainly, but I think probably on, on occasion, Beethoven wrote a tempo marking which was, what was possible rather than what was plausible. Um, a sort of, you know, maybe a challenge to other musicians, maybe, maybe hopeful, maybe indeed that he thought that the next generation and the generation after this, and of course he was true when the next generation's list, would be able to play things in a more dynamic way perhaps that you couldn't do um, previously. And in fact, the last thing of course is that our pianos are much heavier now and our rooms are much bigger. And in the case of string players, we play with a lot more vibrato. And all of those things mean we need to play a bit slower. Um, and we cannot play um, sensibly, or, you know, we can't understand the narrative of a piece um, if we always play absolutely at those, those quite fast metronome markings. Um, I, so, yeah, I know I a, a, a nice story about a string quartet, not the Andelian quartet, I hasten to say, um, who sat down one evening and at the end of their rehearsal, they were going to, they were practicing, they were rehearsing Opus 95, the string quartet in F of minor minor, Opus 95. Very dramatic, very dynamic piece. And there was a lot of argument about the beginning, which goes, did a little bum 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 bum. And so was it, should it be, did a little bum 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 or should it be, did a little bum bum. And they had a bottle of whiskey. And by the end of the night, the whiskey bottle was empty. And they were all at last in agreement that how it should go was exactly this. Very wise. 
Um, so, uh, Carl, well, you, you all spoke about Beethoven as a performer. Could you speak to that a bit more? You mentioned that he slowed down and speeded up as he pleased, it seems, or with crescendos and diminuendos. Um, a little bit more about him. Sure. Um, as, as, as Ruth has already said, of course, he was, he was an amazing improviser. And, and indeed, the very famous case was when he played the, um, the first performance of the Choral Fantasia. And he hadn't really had a chance to write out the big piano part at the beginning. So he improvised it. But curiously at that time, because improvisation was such a common thing, and if you wrote a piece, you were supposed to have written it because writing it was to make a big statement. Um, he didn't want to go on stage and, and, not let, and let the audience know he hadn't written it and was improvising it. So he had someone turn blank pages for him so that the audience actually thought that he was playing off a score, um, which is kind of the other way around to us now, because of course now we play from memory in order that we give the simulacrum of playing by heart because we have invented it, although we, we haven't. Um, so that's, that's certainly one issue. Um, we know that the previous generation of pianists, particularly Mozart, but also again, people like Homo and Moscheles and so on, their main job when playing the keyboard was to, uh, they quote, make it flow like oil. And everything was supposed to look very easy and very elegant. And you had to work hard to make it shimmer and just look like no effort at all. And we know that Beethoven made it look effortful. And he would, he would shove his arm and he would use accents and, 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 and you know, move around to the keyboard. And he did not look elegant at the keyboard. He looked like a man frenzied, possessed, a man at work. And this was, you know, this was shocking to many of the, the people, the musicians, the people who were exploring that at the time. Um, so that in itself was just, just extraordinary. That There was a very different view to, um, to how one should um, do music. Um, what about you, Ruth? Yeah, um, you know, the question of effort is, is really important. I think in a way he was sharing his creativity and he was, I mean, the whole role of the musician in a way was changing he did not want to be seen as a musicus, which was a tradesperson, somebody who the aristocrats would sort of call into their lounge and pay to entertain them. He wanted to be seen as a tone poet. And um, I think, again, we go back to the variation and improvising. He is letting other people in to his to his to the to the sort of workshop of his brain of he is he is sharing his creativity. Um, and, and that's, the, that's where the effort comes. That's where the generosity comes. Because he wanted, going back to Vivet's first question, which I think is a wonderful question, what is it in him that makes him so emotional? It is, he is feeling emotion. He wants you to feel it too. And he wants it to be shared. Indeed. Um, so in a similar vein, Carl, you touched on his ideas of freedom. And um, could you all, uh, and the French Revolution and Napoleon, uh, Ruth, you've, it, it's, it figures prominently in the book. Uh, could you speak to that? Yes, he was, um, as, as we sort of explored, he was from a modest tradesperson background. You know, the, the musicians were tradespeople in Bonn in, in the 1770s. And, um, you know, the, the person, the landlord of their house was a lace maker. Um, and musicians were used to going to extraordinarily grand houses. When I went to these palaces in Silesia, when I saw some of the palaces that he would have played in, I just thought, what a contrast. We don't have really such a contrast in our lives. It would be, in, in an Indian context, it would be like going from a sort of small back street in in um, Jaipur to one of the palaces to work every day and back. It's that bigger contrast. And, um, and there's also clothing, you know, the, the hierarchy, the wigs, the clothes, the costliness, and then the sort of poverty of, of how most people lived. So when the French Revolution began, he was still in the court orchestra. He was on the Rhine going down with the electors orchestra and theater, and theater troupe to play in another palace. And he was all for the revolution, like a lot of people in the German Enlightenment thought. They thought this was wonderful. This was going to overthrow privilege um, 
and so on. After he got to Vienna, just after he got to Vienna, that's when French troops were advancing on, on Germany. They took his hometown of the Rhine. He could never go back again to Bonn. Um, and also that Marie Antoinette was by then in prison. And um, then the guillotine began, Marie Antoinette, the head was chopped off, the bloodbaths began. So people um, a little while away away felt rather differently about the revolution than they had. Then Napoleon came along and um, Beethoven identified with him passionately as a man of the people. He was a man of the people, he was great. And it was under that influence of his great idealism that he wrote the Eroica Symphony, which was then going to be called the Bonaparte Symphony. But um, then um, Napoleon had himself crowned Emperor of France. And that's the famous moment when he scribbles out his name on the manuscript and says he will just be another king. And, um, you know, he, he, he was disgusted. But he still hankered after the heroic statue of the Napoleon who crossed the Alps, the great figure on a white horse. And so um, that's the, that's, and, and then of course he, he occupied, he occupied Vienna twice. The second time he besieged it, it was a very bloody battles by that time. And Beethoven would have seen on the streets hundreds of Austrian veterans, mutilated, wounded, um, and the whole city was impoverished by the siege. So he, he, by then he felt very, very ambivalently about, about Napoleon. I don't know, what, what do you feel, Carl, about, about Beethoven and Napoleon? I mean, I mean, oh, well, I mean, ab absolutely, by, by the time he declares himself, you know, he, he sees the hopefulness of Napoleon and then he sees the inevitableness of, or inevitability rather, of, of someone who takes that position being corrupted by it and, and, and just, just horrified by it. Um, but the, the other thing, I, you know, we, we talk about the big freedoms and, and absolutely we, we need to talk about the post-revolutionary um, outlook, but it, the, we should also consider the small freedoms, it seems to me. Uh, what I mean by that is, of course, Beethoven is essentially, not quite because Mozart did it for a couple of years, is essentially the first what we call freelance musician who, who, earn, who is not part of, of a church or a palace and doesn't have to wear uniform uh, and livery. And, and although he's, of course, given a stipend by the nobles, he's, he's free to live his life. He works with the, with the, the market. He, you know, what he produces ha sells. He publishes in, in three different uh, cities and so on. Um, that uh, freedom, which also, of course, comes with its responsibilities of, of making a living and all the rest of it, um, that freedom of saying, I'm no longer part of that, that servant class. I am an individual, if you like, a genius in my own kind. I think that's very, very important. And, you know, I'm reminded, I, and lots of people don't, don't realise this, um, obviously, traditionally, even still, and sometimes even in India, um, musicians wear tailcoats on stage and, and we wear white tie and bow tie and, and tailcoats and we, we go out on stage and, and people just assume that that's a uniform so we show how important we are. Absolutely not true. The first concerts that happened around this time in Beethoven's lifetime were by freelance musicians and they were freelance partly because of the Napoleonic Wars to be honest and they'd been thrown out because their, their, um, their palaces could no longer afford them. And they were doing this new thing called a public concert where people paid money to go to a concert and, and they sat and listened to these guys. And these guys on stage wanted to show that they were as good as the audience. And so they wore the same clothes as the audience did. And the audience were wearing white tie and tails because it was evening or afternoon as I often was. And so they did to show that they were just as good and no longer wearing uniforms. And that's a very curious kind of freedom. But bizarrely, of course, as, I, as I've often said, really, when I go on stage, I should be wearing jeans and a T-shirt now to show that I'm equal to my audience who are quite possibly doing, doing the same sort of clothing. Um, but yeah, I think that's, a, you know, those kind of small freedoms are also very, very powerful. And we see those happening in Beethoven, I think. Yes. A question from Priya Chaturvedi. Um, a question for Carl, she says, as a musicologist, uh, what is your opinion on Thayer's biography and the most recent one by Jan Swafford? Apart from primary material like Beethoven's letters, um, would, you, would you consider it recommended reading to understand the man and his times? You know, I think, okay. Mm -hmm. We've had a lot of, you know, obviously various things come up about Beethoven through things that are discovered, letters, etc. further research. 
But it seems to me that, whether, that reading there or a modern biography or, or, or somewhere in between is very telling on what was thought about Beethoven. Beethoven's afterlife, you might say. How the Beethoven mm. truth and the Beethoven myth live side by side and inhabit the cultural horizon, the cultural afterlife. And I think that's really, really important. It's brilliant to read early biographies and you see sort of very immediately how Beethoven fills his space. And then, you know, of course, we, are, we live in a slightly more, dare I say, antiseptic society where we want facts rather than, rather than myths, um, which, which I think in some ways depletes our, our enjoyment of, of some biographies because we're, we're very clearly about what real was really happening, but fascinating all the same. And it's, it, I think it's really interesting to follow the progress of, of biography about anybody and what that shows us of what we want to take from that individual, what we want that person to be. Um, uh, equally, when we, I'm, I'm always fascinated by the, the evolution of Bach biographies which sort of go, go, go in cycles of uh, Bach was an ordinary man, Bach was a genius, Bach was a craftsman, Bach was an artist. And we get those kind of cycles of what do we want these composers, performers, musicians to be. Uh, and, and so that's what I would say. Um, I think probably our modern biographies are more palatable to us. We, we don't cringe so much at certain of the, of the writing and, and so on. But I think we do actually, if we're really going to understand the importance of, of any composer, author, creator of, that, of, of, of the past, I think we probably also have to see how they were viewed immediately after, after their lives and, and through the periods in between to get a much better sense of n not perhaps the person, but, but the work that they did and how, how it affects us. But, but, you know, I'm not the writer, Ruth. You are the writer. How do you feel about this? Ruth, you read your yeah. share of biographies. Yes, I read a lot of biographies. The Thayer, of course, is not immediately after. It's quite a long way after. I think for me, of the, of the early ones, the most touching um, and vivid one is the little memoir by Gerhard von Boring. Um, that, um, you can read it in English as The House of the Black Spaniards. He was a boy. He was uh, 10 or 11 when Beethoven was dying. He was the son of Stepan von Breuning, who was his old, Beethoven's old childhood friend. So in a way, this is the most vivid and un, uncluttered by professional um, angles, agendas that there is. And he just remembers him. And it's, the, it's a lovely memoir. I rec really recommend that. Um, Musicologically, I think the best memoir is Lewis Lockwood, who is a fantastic musicologist. He's, I think he's at Princeton, he's 80 now. Um, Barry Cooper's is also very, very good. And, I, and I, you know, I've read those and I've read um, Jan Swafford. And the thing that about bio, new biographies is that they also have much more material than the old biographies. There is still work going on on the amazing volumes of the correspondent, uh, sorry, the um, conversation books. When I was in Bonn in the, in the Beethoven house there, I got one be one concert conversation book it was translated into English. Um, anyway, it's that fat. And that's just a few years um, in sort of 1816 or something. And um, they are fascinating. And it begins, this, this one, which is the very first one, when Beethoven began carrying these things around with him begins with his nephew, his Carl, saying that he doesn't see why he should eat sausage in the same way that Beethoven does and why he should, why he should do it the same way. And I mean, I read a poem about that because I love that this whole mammoth task, mammoth set of volumes begins with a boy refusing to eat sausage in the same way that Beethoven did. And, um, and then you get sort of unhappy things. Occasionally Beethoven writes something into it. But you know, Swafford um, has really been through quite a lot of that material. And you get, I like the way that Carl was talking about the little things, you get the little things, you get, and Beethoven writes in them sometimes when he's making a shopping list, or you've seen an advertisement for an apartment he wants, or where can he buy um, uh, candlesticks or... Or, um, a or when he's had a haircut. Sorry? Every, every now and then it just says, haircut. <laughs> it's yes. just, he's just into the barbers. It's beautiful, isn't it? Yeah. 
but also if, if, if they're in a public place and they're, they're in a tavern or something and he doesn't want the people to hear what he's saying on the next door table, he writes there. Um, so there's a lot of interesting material about that, which gives us insight into what he was doing day by day, which is treasure trove for a biographer, but also about his interaction with other people. So I think that, you know, new biographies and Swafford is tremendous um, judgment and he can synthesize and then make up his own mind. So I would really, really recommend the John Swafford. I think that the, the haircuts were quite, um, were few and far between, wouldn't you say? <laughs> From all the portraits we have of him with his sort of flaming said, hair. Yes, he said about one artist, I like that. Most, most painters make my hair too tidy. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so, um, all of these unrequited loves, Therese among them and others, uh, could you speak about the tragedy? Uh, of, of, I mean, there were, of course, there's the, um, the epic proportions of, you know, the tragedy of his deafness, uh, which uh, for a musician, uh, what can be worse? But um, yes tragedy in Beethoven's life. It's significant. Well, his first tragedy really came at the age of three when his grandfather died. That's his father's father, who was Kapellmeister at the German court, at the Bonn court, and a very, very good singer. Um, and he adored his little grandson. And um, he did not get on with his son, who was Beethoven's father. And he died when Beethoven was three. And Beethoven's father was a harsh man, he disappointed man, I think, and he became alcoholic and he was brutal. So, and so Beethoven always felt right from the age of three that there was somebody who loved him when it was not harsh with him, whom he had lost. And I think that set up a sort of sense of idealizing, which he always had. It's one of the things he felt about Napoleon. He, he idealized Napoleon. And so he was always in love, says um, his friend, um, from school friend, from the age of sort of about 12, 13, he was always in love and usually most affected by the love he was in at the time. But it never came to anything. He was not good looking. He was very pockmarked, probably by sort of um, the pox he had sort of early on, smallpox he had early on. He was very short. Um, he was very intense looking, and I think that the thing which was most commanding about his presence was his eyes um, and his fervor, his enthusiasm. Um, but, you know, he fell in love, you know, at least by the time that he left Bond to go to Vienna, he'd been in love with a soprano who sort of turned him down, she said to her niece long after. Um, and then he kept falling in love with as I say, unattainable women. They were girls who were aristocratic. He met them because he was teaching the piano. And of course their parents didn't want their, their beautiful, precious girl who ought to make a rich, noble marriage to, to have anything to do, you know, romantically with this craftsman whom they were getting to teach her the piano. Um, so that sort of went on. Then there was a really mature love for um, Josephine um, von Daim. Josephine Brunswick, who was a Hungarian countess in her own right. Um, he taught her piano and he taught, he taught a couple of the other girls piano. But her mother was very keen for her to make a rich noble marriage and she married a count whom the mother thought was rich, um, but um, he wasn't. And then um, when she provided three children for him very quickly, he died. And she was so beautiful and there was Beethoven um, at her door and they had long and very intense conversations and the family started to get very worried because he was a commoner and if she a countess and you know married married a commoner her she would lose the right to her aristocratic children to, 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 to have them with her so um, she was gradually, whether it was the family that froze him out or whether it was she herself who wasn't very keen on him uh, romantically. Anyway, that ended. Then there was, yes, Therese or Elise. Um, you know, by then he was 40 and she was 18. Again, he liked 18 year olds. And um, 
it was no good and she was whisked away by her family. And then the most mature love of all, whom we don't know exactly who it was, there are now two or three candidates. Um, and um, she was possibly married for whatever reason, they couldn't be together, the immortal beloved. And then that was it. it he idealized that love um, for the next five years and then wrote to the distant beloved, Andy Fermagalipta. And then he just turned his back on any hope of love and adopted his nephew and thought about God. That's roughly the parabola. Um, but, but, but the tragedy also is his deafness and the medical, the medical history. So he was deaf. By the age of 30, he knew he was going deaf. Terrible. He hadn't really yet properly made his name as a composer, except perhaps for Adelaida and a couple of sonatas. And, uh, the Moonlight Sonata was written as he was going deaf. So if we, like Carl wants, if we take out the, the, the name Moonlight, we could call it a sonata on perceiving you were going deaf, which might be a, a, a more to the point. Yeah. Um, but um, and so that is tragedy. He felt also it was going to cut him off from people. So his heart-rending testament that he wrote in 1802, in October 1802, from the little village of Heiligenstadt, just outside Vienna. It's now a most wonderful museum. I think the best Beethoven museum, apart one. Well, I mean, the, the Bonn one is, is brilliant because it's an archive and a museum for, and it's a center for Beethoven studies. The Heiligenstadt one is, is the most vivid one for seeing where Beethoven would have lived and worked and thought as he was facing going deaf. And um, at the end of that six months, he wrote this testament to, overtly to his brothers, Karl and Johann, only he doesn't write Johann's name, um, possibly because it was also his father's name and he hated his father so much, we don't know. But he says, you say that I am um, misanthropic, you do not know the reason, it is because for the last few years I have been going deaf. I, I almost put an end, he says. Uh, he almost killed himself, but I decided I had to live for my art. And so he goes back and he, in the end, he just stops trying to pretend he's not going deaf. And um, he goes on. And he, it, you know, he was staggeringly stoic in some ways. Um, he, you know, at one point he says, um, he, I think it's in his one of his sketchbooks. He writes, "Cotton wool in my ears um, stops the buzzing sound when I play the piano." That, that, that's what he was living with all the time, um, because he was still composing on the piano, and he couldn't hear it. How frustrating is that? It's remarkable. Um, you, you. When you were in conversation with David Waterman, you mentioned the story of uh, him not being able to hear the audience clapping. Um, That's, yes, when, when that was in the Ninth Symphony. It was the first time that he'd appeared on a stage for about 10 or 11 years. And um, he was conducting it. And it was, of course, revolutionary. It had a choir. It was, had words. It was an extraordinary thing to do, to make. And... Um, there he was conducting it, da, 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 da. but actually behind him was the real conductor. So, so um, conducting the orchestra. So the, the, the violinists were playing, watching the, um, the, other, the other conductor, not Beethoven. So they finished the symphony, but, conduct, but he went on conducting. And so very gently, the alto soloist came up to the podium and turned him round. And then he saw the theater absolutely going wild with clapping and applause, but he couldn't hear it. Um, with that, um, is there anything else you would like to address Ruth or Carl on Beethoven, on working on this um, book? Well, I think, I think um, he would be so pleased to know that people are interested in his music and loving his music and feeling that it is passionate and emotional all over the world. He didn't, he didn't contemplate leaving anywhere. He would have loved to go to Paris and London. He never did. That's as far afield as he was, could possibly have dreamed of going. But he would have loved to have gone to India. He would have been so interested. 
And um, he would just love to know that he is touching hearts today all over the world. Mm. I'm, I'm, I'm sure the, it, it, the, the, the time of Beethoven is the very first time the composers have an inkling that their music may be heard after they die. Um, essentially, Mozart's music is the first music that is regularly heard after he, immediately after he dies, and Handel, to some extent, and Bach gets resurrected about 50, 60 years after he dies. Um, so Beethoven was beginning to be aware that music, his music might be heard not only by people he'd never met, people outside Vienna in Paris or London, people beyond his life. Um, and and that must have been a very strange inkling for any musician at that time who thought music just died with the end of that performance and perhaps may never get performed again. And repeat performances and the idea that you are actually writing the words to tell someone how to play the music or what character it is for people who may not even be born yet was a really extraordinary idea, these musicians. And the idea that I, I cannot believe that Beethoven could have imagined at that point that 250 years later, this music would still be important to people. That, that's, that's, I imagine that would have been too much to understand. And, and, and I think it's you know, extraordinary and glorious that, that it is possible that that has happened in, in for, for him and, and indeed for, for Mozart, Haydn, Bach and so on, that, that they, they, they couldn't have imagined how important they would be. And, and I suppose the flip side is, unfortunately, many more modern composers think they're much more important than they should be because they are played more widely. And that's a whole other business we shouldn't get into. Actually, I think that Beethoven, he knew he was a genius and he was looking to the future all the time. Mm. And he had this, he was very good at the unknown, I think. I love that way that he goes into the unknown and, and we are his unknown. Mm. With that, thank you for this feast over four days for the heart and mind and senses. Ruth, the sounds of you reading and your poetry will continue to resonate in us. Uh, Carl, you played so beautifully. I know you had to learn or relearn many of the pieces to do this for us. That, that was a very great pleasure. And I, I have a huge thanks to Ruth for, I, I mean, I, I enjoyed your book so much, but also to re-engage with some things that I hadn't touched since I was 13 or 14 and go, oh my goodness, this is grown up music. Just because I played it when I was stupid and young does not mean that I shouldn't re-engage with it. So I'm, I'm, I'm eternally grateful to you. And it's been an extraordinary experience. So thank you so much. I think it's the most beautiful rendition of Fur Elise I've ever heard. <laughs> oh, thank you and quite different from the way I learned it. Go ahead, Ruth, you were going to say something. No, it was just such a joy. And Pratiti, thank you, because your, your questions and your perceptions and insights have been so useful. And it, it's just been a wonderful opportunity to put this together with Carl and your playing. Carl is just wonderful. Oh, thank you. So I've, I've enjoyed it so much. And, and I, it's been such a pleasure to meet you. And again, Pratiti, thank you. Thank you so much for all you've, you've done to put these. And for those of you who are listening in, um, obviously, this has been a project that's lasted a month and a half with various videos flying across the world to make sure that we can actually connect it up. And, and also a huge thanks to the BIC and, everyone, and the guys who were doing all the tech to put it together. That's really, really appreciated by us. I mean, you know, of course, we both wish we were in Bangalore at the moment, but, uh, but next time, of course. Yes, indeed. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you.